My name is Edward Reiner, Senior Wetland Scientist at the US EPA in Boston, Massachusetts. Today, my talk is Hydrological Evaluation of Tidal Restrictions at Rumney Marsh in Saugus and Revere, Massachusetts. Rumney Marsh is located about five miles north of Logan International Airport in Boston, Massachusetts, situated behind Revere Beach, a barrier beach within the towns of Lynn, Saugus, and Revere, Massachusetts. Each of the three towns have historically filled about 400 acres of wetlands, resulting in a cumulative loss of 45% of the marsh. Shown here in yellow are additional areas where marshland was excavated. Between 1967 and 1969, 120 acres of marshland was filled to create an embankment 2.4 miles long with 6 million cubic yards of sands and gravel, which was brought in by train and truck from New Hampshire. This project was in, intended for the Interstate 95 project, which was abandoned in 1972. 444 acres of wetlands are restricted from tidal flow to only one channel opening across the entire width of marsh. In 1988, the creation of the Rumney Marsh's Area of Critical Environmental Concern established a goal to remove the embankment fill to restore the marsh. The sands and gravel fill material without vegetation to stabilize it has been eroding for decades as documented here. Erosion impacts continue unabated despite attempts to control it with silt fence as shown here. So why remove the embankment? The answer is simple, to restore wetland habitat, salt marsh and intertidal habitat. There's no better place to do it than at Rumney Marsh where there's an abandoned highway that will never be constructed. It's a stated goal in the 1988 designation of the Rumney Marsh's Area of Critical Environmental Concern. And we could beneficially reuse the embankment soils for other public works projects, such as beach nourishment on Revere Beach or Winthrop Shores as done in the past by DCR, or dune creation as part of flood protection plans for the Point of Pines or Revere Beach. It's relatively easy to restore intertidal habitat in salt marsh. All you have to do at Rumney Marsh is to remove the fill material from the embankment to the appropriate elevations for the reestablishment of intertidal habitat. Salt marsh grew on its own in one of the two areas depicted here, as I'll show you next. Vegetation establishment can come in on its own if the conditions are right, particularly the elevations of the excavation in order to match the grades for appropriate salt marsh vegetation to grow. As shown in the upper left, salicornia came in on its own and in the upper right quadrant, you can watch in a time series, here's 2011, with a lot of Spartina alterniflora, salt marsh cord grass coming in on its own. And here's a 2014 photo. These pictures really do show a very successful intertidal habitat restoration project was performed at Rumney Marsh by fill removal for the Central Artery Project. You can find this map on our EPA website by just searching for EPA Rumney Marsh. This map depicts not only the fact that almost half the marsh has been filled historically since 1803, but it also depicts in red areas where invasive species dominate, typically due to tidal restrictions such as tide gates or undersized culverts. In yellow are areas where potentially fill removal projects can occur to reestablish salt marsh grades and intertidal habitat, particularly in the center of the photo along the I-95 abandoned highway embankment. In green are areas of completed restoration projects. To date, 
we've achieved about 66 acres of restoration throughout Rumney Marsh. So what have we achieved to date? Well, the embankment fill represents approximately 120 acres of impact to Rumney Marsh. And to date, we removed about 37 acres. There's a lot more that can be done, but in particular, we have not addressed the tidal restriction associated with the embankment, which only has one opening at the relocated Pines River crossing. 444 acres are affected by this abandoned highway embankment. This is the relocated Pines River Channel, which was armored with heavy stone riprap. In the background are two of the three bridges on State Route 107 that were replaced between 2010 and 2012 or so. Completed around 2012, the reconstruction of three bridges on Route 107 increased tidal flow on purpose to help control invasive species, reduce erosion, and increase recreational navigation. Two of the three bridges on Route 107 were tripled in terms of their length, increasing flow capacity by more than 50% according to the permit documents. The third bridge, the Pines River Bridge, had an increased capacity of 28% due to its increased length according to permit documents. Observations during king tides, which are the highest spring tides of the year, reveal that people are getting flooded, whether they're upstream of the embankment, downstream of the embankment, or along the main stem of the Saugus River, as depicted here in East Saugus and Lynn. Or here in East Saugus, where a new home was constructed uh, in the floodplain. Flooding from the Saugus River side of the estuary also occurs, as depicted here, with tidal water flowing over Ballard Street and into the neighborhoods. The purpose of our study was to determine whether breaching the embankment to restore the former cutoff drainage patterns would adversely affect tidal flooding of low-lying property. We installed pressure transducers at seven locations throughout the estuary for 142 days, collecting data at six-minute intervals. The elevations of the pressure transducers was surveyed using a Trimble R8 global navigation satellite system, which has a vertical precision of 15 millimeters. We chose the locations for the seven pressure transducers to be on either side of each of the restrictions in the marsh, the railroad, Route 107, the I-95 embankment, as well as at Ballard Street, where there's an undersized culvert with a makeshift tide gate along the Saugus River. These pictures show the Ballard Street salt marsh on the left side is confined by roads such as Route 107, Ballard Street, Eastern Avenue, and Bristol Street. On the top right, you can see the old tide gate, a cast iron type, broke off its hinges and was replaced by a plate of steel chained to the deteriorating headwall to function as a makeshift tide gate. On the bottom right, debris that was blocking the culvert was removed. Tidal flow is now reestablished at the Ballard Street salt marsh and that has resulted in the stunting of Phragmites and the reestablishment of salt marsh along the tidal creeks. To 
This is a graph showing peak daily water level by body of water over a four week period, which was typical of the results that we observed throughout the 142 day study. The Saugus River always had the highest peak daily water level and Ballard Street salt marsh always had the lowest, which was to be expected due to the makeshift tie gate at the site. The other five locations only varied by a few tenths of a foot. We used an app created with Click to calculate the max, mean higher high water, and mean high water levels that are depicted here. Explaining the results, as tidal water passes underneath the railroad bridge, there's no difference in the tidal datums calculated, whereas as water passes underneath the Route 107 bridges, there's a reduction of about two-tenths of a foot at mean high water with a greater reduction at the highest tide observed. The reduction observed at I-95 embankment shows a diminishing reduction with higher tides. At Ballard Street, there is a significant reduction in peak tidal in the tides due to the makeshift tide gate and undersized culvert. The 1989 study by the Corps of Engineers determined that mean high water was three-tenths of a foot lower on the upstream side of the I-95 embankment as compared to the Pines River. Mean spring high water was eight-tenths of a foot lower, and the maximum annual high tide line was 1.7 feet lower on the upstream side of the embankment as compared to the Pines River. However, in our 2019 water level study, after the construction of the three bridges on Route 107, mean high water difference is virtually null as well as mean higher high water difference. And the maximum observed difference instead of 1.7 feet is now reduced to two tenths of a foot. We'll look at a bar chart with the same results and we could see again, the difference between the mean high water in 1989 and mean high water in 2019 is um, is six tenths of a foot here. And this is quite interesting because this six tenths of a foot difference represents sea level change. So we have a documented six tenths of a foot rise increase in mean high water at the Pines River between 1989 and 2019. This bar chart also shows that, that the difference at the mean spring high water in 1989 was eight tenths of a foot, as previously mentioned. However, in 2019, there's virtually no difference. And our maximum annual high tide line was 1.7 foot difference in 1989, but only two tenths of a foot difference now in our maximum observed 2019 water level differences. Here's a graphic illustration of our full 142-day study results, which also added Boston Harbor tide gauge data, a verified tidal data that is collected at the Boston Harbor tide gauge. What's really interesting in looking at the results is in green, the Saugus River upstream of Route 107 always had slightly higher water levels as compared to Boston Harbor. As one proceeds through the estuary, there's a slight diminishment of water level, particularly as water passes upstream of Route 107. What's also interesting is water levels on the upstream side of the I-95 embankment in East Saugus are actually slightly higher than the immediate downstream side, uh, uh, which is upstream of Route 107. And this is an interesting phenomena caused by the fact that water is already draining in the section of marsh between the I-95 embankment and Route 107, as it is still filling the 444 acres upstream of the I-95 embankment. In this regard, the I-95 embankment is retarding the drainage that otherwise might occur in a quicker fashion because it hasn't even filled up before it, it, it already is starting to drain um, in Boston Harbor and, and elsewhere. So this effect, in a sense, might demonstrate 
that the I-95 embankment does restrict the tides, but it restricts the tides in a manner that actually increases the water level on the upstream side in comparison to a situation where if it didn't exist, what would the water level be? We can similarly graph mean high water results every day and compare it. And what we find is Boston Harbor tide gauge is again, slightly lower than the Saugus River mean high water, um, likely caused by the shape of the estuary and what we feel is a tidal amplification effect. The lower Pines River is always slightly lower than Boston Harbor, two tenths of a foot or so, as you could see here. And upstream in East Saugus is a slightly higher water level, two tenths of a foot again, uh, as compared to upstream of Route 107. And all of this is, again, due to the fact that water starts to drain before it fully filled the upper estuary. This slide added in green mean higher high water tidal datums as calculated for the 142 day period. So each of these tidal datum calcula as calculated using CLIC reflects the same general arrangement that Boston Harbor tide gauge data is generally slightly lower than what we found on the upstream of Route 107 Saugus River site and that Route 107 clearly is the cause of the tidal restriction, which actually results in higher water levels on the upstream side of the I-95 embankment in East Saugus as compared to the immediate downstream side, which is upstream of Route 107. And this is due to the, phase, the significant time phase delay that it takes to fill the estuary such that water is still filling in the upper estuary, the 444 acres upper estuary above the I-95 embankment as it already has started to recede um, in the Lower Pines River and at the Route 107 bridges. Conclusion, Route 107 slightly restricts tides in the Pines River estuary. The abandoned I-95 embankment can be removed without increasing existing flooding problems. We're showing here in blue the historical creeks that were severed, but rather than just restoring the severed connections, we are suggesting a removal focus area depicted in red, which would remove the retained flood protection berm that had been formally required to be retained based on the belief that the I-95 embankment was providing unintended flood protection benefits to East Saugus. By removing the area shown in red, we could reestablish sheet flow across the salt marsh surface and help to reduce the erosion that's currently occurring along the channel that was constructed on the upstream side of the embankment. This would help to restore the proper drainage and help mitigate the flooding problems in East Saugus. A plan for breaching the embankment should restore as much sheet flow across the marsh as possible rather than just confining a restoration project to the creek itself. This will help to address the significant erosion that has occurred along the straight constructed artificial channel that was dredged to relocate the drainage systems to the new channel opening at the relocated Pines River crossing. On the left is an example of one of the groundwater monitoring wells that was installed in salt marsh during the initial construction to monitor groundwater effects. The results of that monitoring I've never seen. However, the monitoring wells are now almost in the creek itself because of erosion of the salt marsh from the channelized flow. Beneficial impacts of embankment removal would include improved nursery and feeding habitat for 31 species of fish and countless birds and wildlife that frequent the area. It would improve sediment distribution for marsh accretion, improve coastal resiliency in the face of sea level rise, improve control of invasive species, improve drainage for East Saugus, 
decrease erosion, and restore salt marsh and intertidal habitat. In order to further the ecological restoration efforts by fill removal of the abandoned highway embankment, it suggested that permittee responsible mitigation efforts continue to target Rumney Marsh for their required aquatic resource mitigation. If permittee responsible mitigation efforts aren't done, the use of in-lieu fee program funds may be applied for potentially by the Department of Conservation and Recreation who owns the embankment lands. The continued use of fill is expected in order to uh, help with beach nourishment and dune creation projects since this material would be suitable for such uses. It also may be possible to obtain supplemental environmental project funds which are associated with penalty agreements for Clean Water Act violations elsewhere. Lastly, grants for proactive wetland restoration can be applied for. And it suggested that a requirement for mitigation of new floodplain fill be established since the Corps of Engineers wanted to protect the estuary from filling in order to reserve this important flood storage area in case they build the Saugus River floodgate project. Thank you very much. For further information, please check out EPA's website about Romney Marsh by just searching EPA Romney Marsh. You'll also be able to find some interesting videos that were not performed by EPA if you just search Romney Marsh video. Thank you very much.